our speaker this year uh, grew up with his brother and his sister in a home. Uh, he was basically raised by a single mom. And then as a, as a married physician, he's raised three daughters. So here at our father-son uh, dinner, we have the father of three daughters who was raised by his mom. But Dr. Ely, Dr. Wes Ely, is one of the best Catholic men that I know, and in particular, he is a real man for others, and that's really why we invited him this year. Truth be told, he's also a very old friend of mine. We've known each other since we were 13 years old, and uh, we basically grew up together in high school. Eugene Wesley Ely Jr. is a physician and professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He conducts research as a geriatric intensivist in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and the Center for Health Services Research. His work is focused on aging, delirium, and post-ICU dementia. The diagnosis and treatment protocols developed by Dr. Ely and his research group have been validated by independent studies, translated into many languages, and adopted by hospitals around the world. Dr. Ely is also a Jesuit grad. He attended Jesuit High School in Shreveport, Louisiana, our alma mater. He then attended, in a somewhat questionable, questionable decision, Tulane University in New Orleans. I speak as an LSU grad. Uh, he attended Tulane University in New Orleans, where he graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in biology in 1985. He went on to attend the University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, graduating with a public health master's degree in 1989. That same year, he earned his medical degree from Tulane Medical School. He went on to do his residency at Wake Forest, and he's the president now of the Nashville Guild of Catholic Medical Association. He also writes reflective opinion pieces and editorials about his experiences as a physician. And these pieces have been published in many different places, including the Annals of Internal Medicine, and the Wall Street Journal, among other periodicals. I think Dr. Ely is one of those rare physicians that you could say he not only provides outstanding care to his patients, because he also sees patients, but he actually cares for his patients. He participates in the ongoing debate on euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide through medical literature and international de debates. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Dr. Wes Ely. Where'd my shoot go? Okay, fellas, how's everybody doing tonight? Jaden and Jason, that was very moving. Thank you both. They're okay, they're coming back. Well, we'll start with a story or two, and then I'll move on. And remind me at the end that I want to end with a short prayer. I'll get carried away and I'll forget, but it's worth it because of what Jason and Jaden just did for us and what Jaden said about his father. So just remind me at the end to, uh, to end with a prayer. Let me start with a quiz. I'm from Louisiana. We say Louisiana. You guys are all from Florida. You think you're everything about water, but I flew in from New Orleans just today. I was down there for my medical school reunion. And I was reminded today of a thing that my brother and I used to do. Richard said that I grew up without a dad. When I was little, uh, I was three, my father decided to leave us. And so my brother, who was two, and I and my mom came back to Shreveport from South America. And she began to raise us. She was pregnant with my sister, but didn't know it. Uh, my dad made a bad decision and asked my mom to have an abortion. He, she decided not to do that, so I have a sister and a brother and a wonderful mom. All the fathers in the room here know that we have not all made the best decisions in our lives, and some of these bad decisions come in different degrees of badness. My dad made a few pretty bad decisions when I was growing up, but I love him just the same. And I love the way that Jaden talked about his father, and that love that Jaden has for Jason, I also have for my father. My father and I, in later life, began a, a wonderful relationship when I was an adult, years after I had grown up. He never saw a single football game I ever played. He never saw me get an all-state swimming championship or all-city, all-district football players, any of that stuff. He missed it all. And yet, nothing could break the bond of the love that I had for my father. Nothing could break the bond, even though he'd made bad decisions, of the love that my father had for me. Because that relationship is built upon the same relationship 
that our Heavenly Father has for us. And the Jesuit education is built on faith and service for others. Exactly the same way that we have faith in our fathers and you as fathers have faith in your sons. No manner of bad decisions will ever break that bond. And I'm saying that on purpose because students, your course in life is not going to be linear. It is not going to be a straight course towards success. It's not going to be a straight course towards agreeing with your dad. Your dads are going to have to learn boundaries. When you go off to college, they're going to have to learn how to let you go and be on your own. And it's super hard for parents. Anyway, let's get back, and I'm going to come back to some of these points. Let's get back to this quiz I was going to give you from a Louisiana boy to a bunch of Florida men. What am I making if I have a small net coat hangers, shoelaces, and blood bait. Crawfish, crawfish traps, exactly. When my father left us, we came back to Louisiana, and we had no money. My mother made $14,000 a year. She got a raise to $17,000 a year to raise the three of us. She worked at Jesuit. She was a teacher there. Later, she ran a youth shelter for young men and women who were runaways or kicked out of the house by their kids. <clears throat> so we had no money. So my brother and I learned early how to take a net, shoelaces for our old shoes, some blood bait, tie it all together, and string the coat hangers up to a pinnacle. And we would make 10 of those and go set them down in a local bayou and take some sticks and spend two hours collecting the crawfish on top of those nets. And we, what were we doing? Providing for our family, serving our mother, and bringing home dinner that we couldn't afford otherwise. And it, to this day, is an incredibly rich memory in my mind of how my brother and I, as young kids, learned how to provide for our families. So the Jesuit education. Let's begin with the end in mind. Yell out somebody, what does this mean in English? A-M-D-G. For the greater glory of God. What is it in Latin? Right. Ad maiam de gloriam. This slogan of St. Ignatius, upon which he founded the Jesuits, for the greater glory of God, has been with me my entire life. And every time I've gotten off course in life, distanced myself from God, made bad decisions, I have always tried to remind myself to fall back onto AMDG. I still sign my letters to my friends with AMDG, and I still take my guidance from AMDG and Ignatius's principle and foundation. If a young child asks me, as my daughters did, Daddy, why are we here? My answer is, Brooke, Blair, Taylor, my daughters, we are here to praise, reverence, and serve God, and so by doing, to save our souls. That's the principle and foundation. And that is the foundation of your education and what you should always try and fall back on when you are making some questionable decisions, feeling distance from God, and just don't quite have your act together. Why are we here? To praise reverence and serve God, and so by doing, to save our souls. So one of the main messages I want to leave you with is not to separate all of that from the rest of your life. Don't have a separate work life and a separate faith life. Integrate these two things. When I was a medical student at Tulane and working in Charity Hospital in New Orleans, which was an indigent hospital with 19 people in a room, one day I had a patient whose name was Maisie Jackson. Maisie was 99 years old. She was a beautiful black woman who grew up in the South. She was about 10 days away from being 100 came in the hospital with a profound pneumonia and heart failure, and I, as a student, was assigned to get Maisie to live to be 100. I remember the long nights I was talking with Maisie, sitting down, talking about her life and my life, and the things we talked about weren't medicine, they were our faith. And right then, as I look back on it, I was integrating AMDG and the principle and foundation into my life as a doctor. Not two separate things, one unified vocation. To the point that when Maisie was better 
and ready to leave the hospital, she said, Dr. Wes, why don't you come to our church? And without asking any questions, I said, I'd love to. I got my girlfriend, Kim, who's now my wife of 30 years, and we went to this shotgun barrel-shaped white building church with black shutters in the heart of New Orleans in the Ninth Ward on a 110-degree day. We were dressed up, but they were dressed up more. And we walked in that church, the only two white people in that entire black Southern Baptist church. And after sitting down on the first pew with Maisie, this relationship forged through our integration of faith and life and what I was doing as a doctor, medical student, she said, Dr. Wes, it's your turn to preach. And in that day, I was sweating bullets already. It was so damn hot in there. They put me up in the pulpit, and I had to sit there and preach. And they were going, amen, brother, amen, brother, amen, Jesus, Jesus, bring Jesus. And I was preaching to these people in this black church, a silly white man, and I have never forgotten that moment and never wanted to forget the way that we should integrate our faith into the lives of all of those around us. Whatever you choose to do, whether you're a businessman, whether you're in medicine, whether you're in sports, whatever that is, you are trying to accomplish one thing. And that came up on the road to this event tonight from the airport. John picked me up from the airport. He was telling me about the best three high schools in town, the two other college preps and Jesuit. And I thought to myself, he kept saying college prep, college prep. And I kept thinking to myself, but Jesuit isn't college prep, it's heaven prep. And that's really why you're different than every other school. Because you are preparing your sons, and sons you are being prepared for the long range goal here, which is not just getting to college. It is learning how to integrate this faith that has become the foundation of your high school into your life so that you can someday get to heaven. When I was a boy and way before I was confirmed, I remember my mom gave me this little bookmark. And on the bookmark, she wrote on it, Wes, Jesus loves you. May you always know this and live to serve him all the days of your life. I remember that bookmark like it was yesterday. And the thing is, about getting that message from my mom, I totally believed it. I looked at what she wrote, Jesus loves you, may you live to serve him all the days of your life. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker on that day. <clears throat> and it really is the heart of Jesuit faith men for service, isn't it? Jesuit faith built on the love of Jesus for us, faith in him, faith is confident assurance of things we hope for and a belief in these things that we can't see. And taking that message from that little bookmark that my mom gave me as a kid, I went forward, got confirmed. Uh, I was always taught everybody in here is, is, a, is body, mind, and spirit. On the day that I was confirmed, I knew my spirit was getting affected. All of your spirits got affected on that day. Some of us may not have been physically affected. I remember on my confirmation that I was shaking in the pews, and I had goosebumps all over my body. I've subsequently talked to lots of people about that. Very few people have a physical response to confirmation. I was lucky to, to have that. But every single person has a spiritual response. So your soul is, not di is different. It will never be the same as it was prior to that induction of the Holy Spirit, that indelible change in your life. And yet, despite all of that, back to the notion that your course will not be linear. All of this given to us, we are still going to make these mistakes, like my dad did in leaving us. It made no sense for him to leave behind us as kids. But he did. It was a bad decision. And yet I still love him. And he loves me from heaven. He's passed away. Fulton Sheen says that we all live two lives. We live, there, there, we all have two lives. We have one perfect blueprint for our life. And then we have the life that we actually live, which is something off 
of that perfect blueprint. I think Fulton Sheen writes about this in World's First Love, a book about Mary. And every single person in here has this life that we live that is something off of the perfect blueprint. And all of us, every single day, are trying to get that closer and closer to the perfect blueprint. Only one human being, regular human being, ever lived one version, the blueprint, and their actual life, and that was Mary. Jesus doesn't count because he was divine. He was the God-man. But Mary lived her exact blueprint, and none of us do. We can use the relationship with Mother Mary, though, to get us closer. Raise your hand if you read the book A Wrinkle in Time or seen the movie. Okay, a lot of you. At one point in the, at one point in the book, they have a drawing. He asks... Um, he asks the, the witch, I think it's what's it, which what's it or whatever, how do you wrinkle time? And they have a, a, a string, and they have an ant on a string. And the ant is trying to get from one place to the other. If I ask you what's the shortest distance between two lines, you're going to tell me a straight line. Between two points, you're going to tell me a straight line. We would like our lives to have that direction towards God. Instead, we all go this circuitous route to get to God. And boys, when you go off to college... You're going to live somewhat of a circuitous route, perhaps. I doubt you'll live it as closely as Mary did. But in Wrinkle in Time, they bring the two points together, the string drops down, and the ant gets to just lope over, straight over to the destination. Ever since I saw that drawing, I've thought, that's what Mary is doing for me in my life with Jesus. Mary is not just allowing a straight line between two points, me and God. She actually shortens the distance. So we pray to Mother Mary to point our gaze on her son and to not just keep us in a straight line, but to actually keep us right at Jesus' breast. And I've used that analogy in my life many times as I've been going through medical school, etc. Let's go back to Maisie Jackson. I'll tell you a few more stories and I'll wrap it up. Maisie Jackson, the same lady that took me into the pulpit that day at the church. I was telling her that I wanted to become a missionary to serve patients in foreign lands. Maisie had been to Africa. She had been a missionary in the 50s when she was a young woman. And I told her that I'd raised money to go to Africa, but that I'd fallen in love with this woman named Kim, my wife of 30 years now. She said to me something I'll never forget. Dr. Wes, sometimes Africa is in your own backyard. And I didn't regret any longer not going to Africa and not going on my planned trip to Belize. And I decided to become a missionary right where I was planted. St. Therese of Lisieux talks about that too. When she, a modern day saint, was around for the advent of the elevator, when she was a woman, they were just inventing the elevator, she said that little acts of kindness would be her elevator to God. She wanted to be a missionary as well. She, wanted, she prayed to go around the world, but she never left the confines of that small convent in France. But yet she found a way to God that would carry her around the world. I eventually became a missionary in Haiti. I go to Haiti all the time. I'll be there in a few months. We have lots of different programs in Haiti. My daughter started a nonprofit for pediatric dental care there. They take care of 30,000 kids uh, with the money they've raised. And we work at a Partners in Health Hospital in Haiti, bringing critical care to the uh, amazing Haitian people. But one day, I was at a homeless shelter in Haiti. And off in the distance, there was a man, and he had flies all around him. I brought the man in so I could see what the flies were all about. And he had these... Sorry, it's not dinner conversation, but he had these ridiculous sores all around his ankles, and the flies were trying to attack these sores with the, because of the blood that was leaking out of his ankles. I was taking care of this gentleman. I had him lay down so I could examine his heart and his chest, and I noticed his T-shirt. This man, in a homeless shelter, which is in excel, itself an oxymoron in Haiti, in a homeless shelter in Haiti, all the way across the ocean from France had a t-shirt on that was talking about St. Therese of Lisieux, the same person who wanted to be a missionary who never left the confines of her small convent in Lisieux, and now, 100 years later, a 
poverty-stricken man in Haiti is wearing a shirt with her picture and name on it in Haiti. It shows you the power of God and the power of you, each and every person in this room, to use that message of faith and service for others to make an imprint on other people's lives right where you're planted. Do not separate your business ventures from your faith, your medicine from your evangelization of Jesus. It does not have to be in words. It's mostly in actions, actually. And that's what I've been learning throughout my time as a physician and as a person who takes care of the most critically ill patients on the planet in ICUs. Uh, I'm going to close with, with one more story. I was in Haiti one night, and the priest said, Dr. West, we have this woman. She's very sick, and um, she's dying, we think. Well, I'd like for you to go see her tomorrow. And I, it was nighttime, and I said, let's go see her right now. And he said, well, let's just wait till tomorrow. It'll be easier. I said, no, I want to go see her right now. So we got in the car. We drove with the headlights on this Land Rover over mountains and rocks. There were no roads where this young woman was. And I came to this hut. There were uh, chickens up in the corners of this small hut. It was probably about as, twice as big as one of your tables. That was the hut. Ten people lived in this little hut. There was no room to stand. She was in the center of the hut, lying down on a cot. And they had cut out places for her knees and her arms because, and I walked up to her, I said, excuse me, what is your name in Creole? She said, my name is Eclide Simeon, and I am 13 years old. Beautiful voice, beautiful teeth, beautiful eyes. And I lifted up her leg, blood started dripping from her leg, blood was dripping from her arms. She had ulcers all over her back. Her story was this. As a young girl, her father had left her. Her mother couldn't handle it, and they gave her to another woman in town named Kim, same name as my wife. Kim was taking care of a cleed in a different hut on another mountain in another area of this region called Lavalie in Haiti. And one night, a guy who was doing a drug deal came from Port-au-Prince asking for the person who he was doing the deal with, whose name was Kim. And he asked where Kim was. And he got the wrong directions and came to a cleat's Kim. It was, a, it was a mistaken identity. And he came in the house and pointed a gun at this woman and shot it. A cleat saw what was going on, jumped in the way of the bullet, and took the bullet in the neck to save her foster mother's life, thereby paralyzing her for life. So she's paralyzed from the neck down and had no medical care to take care of her after the initial wound had somewhat healed. And so in Haiti... There's no way to get around in a wheelchair. She was paralyzed, and she was going to die in this hut. My medical school roommate, a guy named Darren Portnoy, worked for Medicine Sans Frontier. We decided one night, we were smoking cigars on a, on a rooftop in New Orleans. We decided, we made the commitment to one another that we would live to improve the lives of people that we would never meet. It was kind of a hokey promise, but that's what we promised to each other. I went through tertiary care. ICU medicine, and Darren became the president of Doctors Without Borders and won the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, from my phone, I called Darren, who was in New York at the time. I said, Darren, I need a hospital to take care of this young woman. You have an MSF hospital, Medicine Sans Frontier, in uh, Port-au-Prince. And he said, yes. He called. We arranged it. I got a helicopter. We flew her over there. They did multiple surgeries on her. Over a period of six months, everything healed up. She's now my Haitian daughter lives in Haiti, and we didn't do a great job with all of this. We didn't have pain medicine. Uh, she was suffering. Uh, she's got tons of bad scars. It, it, was, it was rough. I mean, this was not perfection by any means. Um, but it reminds me of a quote that I wanted to share with you tonight that many of you in the room will know. But it's a quote I didn't understand at first. And because I decided to focus on mistakes and not glory tonight as a father and as a kid, and how your life won't be a linear road to God. The quote is from GKC, GK Chesterton, and it's anything that is worth doing is worth doing poorly. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing poorly. Doesn't mean you want to do it poorly. 
It means that it was so important to take care of a cleat that night that even if I was going to do it poorly, I was going to get the job done. And I was going to use AMDG and Why Are We Here to praise, reverence, and serve God as my guide the entire way. No matter how much I bumbled through it, it was worth doing. So even if I did it poorly, I was going to mush ahead. And that's what we did. You can try to continue to get better, and we should, and we must. And if you can get something in your life to perfection, then that's beautiful. But most of us won't. Most of us won't become the best in the world at what we do. One night, I did have the chance to witness somebody who was the best in the world. And I'll close with this story, and then I'll, I'll have my prayer. Has anybody seen the movie, Jiro Dreams of Sushi? You got it? It's an incredible movie. And if you haven't seen it, most of you haven't, you should go to Netflix and watch this flick. It's about the greatest sushi chef on the planet. And I was asked one day to go to Japan to speak to the Japanese Critical Care Society, and I told them, I will go under one condition. You get me a reservation at Jiro's restaurant. This is a little bitty restaurant in a subway station in Tokyo. And Jiro, an old man, has been making sushi for 60 years. It's a three-star Michelin restaurant in a subway station. It makes no sense, except that his passion and his drive to do something this beautifully have prevailed. So I walked into the restaurant. I and the person who made the reservation were the only two people to eat in Jiro's restaurant that night. And he put down the first piece of sushi. You get 20 pieces. 20 pieces of sushi, and then you're out. He put it down. I reached out with my southpaw hand <clears throat> to, to, to pick up the sushi with the chopsticks. And Jiro started spinning around. It's like, whoa, what's, what's he doing? And his son, who's there, says, Jiro's upset with himself because he didn't notice that you were left-handed. And so every other piece of sushi from then on was angulated to fit perfectly to my left hand. About six pieces in, Jiro told me to paste this one liquid sauce on a piece of sushi. On the seventh piece, I started to paste that piece of sushi. Jiro starts spinning around again. I said, what did I do? He said, that's only for the sixth piece of sushi. That's not for the seventh piece of sushi. About 16, 17 pieces in, I thought, I do not want this to end. This is such an incredible meal. It's the most impressive thing I've ever seen, the degree of love and passion he has for this sushi, that I just decided to slow it down a bit. But the point is that I usually bumble through things in life. I don't get them nearly as right as Jiro does. But as GK says, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. And I'll keep striving to be a better dad, to love my daughters in the way that the father loves me, I'll learn from the mistakes my own dad made towards me. And we can all agree that the Catholic education is successful when the Catholic graduate knows that God is the center of all truth. In fact, a line that secular society is switching on us is this line. God is God and I am not. And the secular world wants you to believe and the boys, when you go to college, you're going to be told this by all your friends and on social media. You're going to be told, I am God, and God is not. And I want you to remember tonight at this Father-Son meal to emblazon in your brain that God is God and we are not. And God is the center of all truth. Let me close with this prayer. I'll get my... Uh... Now this prayer... Jaden said about his father. He said that his father used to play games and his father had him in his mind before he was ever born. And he wanted to have a son named Jaden. Jason had this. Psalm 139, I did not plan to, uh, to share this with you, but I think it's too perfect. Psalm 139 is basically the psalm that says that, what you said. Did you know that? Go home tonight and read Psalm 139, Jaden. I go to silent retreat every year at Manresa in Louisiana, and one year this was shared with me by the retreat master. It's a, it's a version of Psalm 139 
written by a 15-year-old kid in high school. She was from St. Clement of Rome School in New Orleans. And they were given a 10-minute assignment. In 10 minutes, she did this. Wrote her own Psalm 139. They all had to write it. At the end of the essay, at the end of the assignment, the priest in the room said, okay, some people volunteer. And everybody's like, ooh, ooh, me, me, me. I want to read my Psalm 139. She did not raise her hand. She was in the back of the room looking down. She did not volunteer. She was embarrassed. Didn't think it worthy. And here's what she said. My God, you are the sun that shines upon my face during the day. You are the moon and stars that watch me sleep at night. You are the gentle wind that soothes my aching heart, the kind hand that wipes away my tears. In my hours of most need, you are there to comfort me. In my most happy moments, you are there to help me rejoice. My deepest fears and darkest secrets you already know. You created and molded me. In my mind, you are a constant. You touch me, and I'm no longer troubled. You speak to me, and I'm no longer afraid. Your love is my life source, for which there is no substitute. Written in 10 minutes in Southern Louisiana by a little girl whose actual name was Angela Christmas. Thank you, and have a good night.